Greetings, everyone. I want to make sure everyone can hear me out there. We have good volume. So we're ready to go. All right, so let's get this thing started here. So we're going over, oops, uh, Ernst Cassira and the anthropocentric view of law. But we're not going to be sticking with that word for very long because we got to get into the depth of this and what it's all about and who Ernest Cassira is, was, and what we're going to learn from him today. So first things first, uh, let's get to, yep, uh, let's see here, the table of contents. So we're going to have an introduction. We're going to go over this table of contents very quick. We're going to find out Kassira is a public person. What was the socio-political context that marked the transition to, to Weimar? So we're going to look at some, we're going to first get to the introductions, what we're going to do, so that this stuff will make some sense. A lot of this stuff is based on other philosophical schools, and what Kassira did was more of a synthetic approach to the philosophers, whereas many philosophers try to look at either a mathematical or a humanistic or a theological type of uh, foundation of their philosophy. And what it gave rise to is various types of, of myths and religions and uh, cultures. And what Kassira did was isolate and encapsulate what it was that was the causes of this strange force of what's only in men and women, not in any other animals. So what is this thing that causes the creation of these uh, abstract structures such as cultures and myths, etc., language, religion? And he came down to the words of symbolic form. And symbolic form is basically the philosophy of Ernst Cassira, and what we can learn from him is this, is the symbolic form is what has been the evolution of humanity from the animal world. But getting a little bit of, uh, beyond that, so it's a relation to Neo-Kantianism. So Kant was the uh, German uh, philosopher that was very much rooted into an epistemology of innate senses that were God-given which quickly runs into a problem because the adaptability is a major function of life. And without having that into a philosophy, it's incomplete. Let's continue through this table of contents. Um, jurisprudence is going to come into here. Scandinavian realist jurisprudence. So we, we're getting in some very deep philosophical insights. But the thing I like about Kassira is that he's a 20th century philosopher. And this stuff comes after all these other philosophers that have been so inaccessible to many of us. And now when you get this broken down into a philosophy that embodies things like human rights and social contract, you have to have a philosophical foundation before you can bring these thoughts into action in the real world. So let's continue here. What is a social contract for Kassira? What are the conditions for the pro pro possibility of a promise? These are very deep things. You know, this is the linguistic turn of social contract theory. You know, his philosophical justification of human rights. So the, the neo-Kantian jurisprudence. What is neo-Kantian ju jurisprudence? as opposed to what we have here, the Scandinavian realist jurisprudence. So what we're not going to go through this whole book. It's a pretty big book. But what I want to do is just to get through the first introduction of this, which in itself isn't very brief. So this should be able to take care of our entire episode here. Because by us reading this introduction, we're going to uh, understand the philosophy of symbolic forms. And this is something that has been far overlooked in both philosophy, in law, jurisprudence, in our day-to-day -day lives. 
So let's get through this here. And I think you'll all find this to be a very enlightening uh, and empowering type of, of information that you'll be able to take forward with you for the rest of your lives and hopefully for posterity. All right, let's continue. This work introduces and systematically elaborates on law as symbolic form. It is inspired by the philosophy of symbolic forms of Ernst Cassirer, 1874 to 1945. For this reason, it must be immediately it must immediately eliminate the barriers that have previously prevented the treatment of law and jurisprudence within the framework of Cassirer's philosophy. Cassirer was not a mere theoretical philosopher. His philosophy not only gives room systematically to ethics and law, but moreover, it is deeply ethically inspired. It is the level of sophistication, as the title Philosophy of Symbolic Forms makes apparent, and the theoretical depth of his works that distinguishes Kassira from his mentor, Herman Cohen. Nevertheless, as is the case with Cohen, Kassira remains firmly bound to a practical commitment, an example to that of human dignity, and more specifically, for our present purposes, human rights. All right, so we got some people in the room here. Oh, great, we got El Perro. Excellent, excellent. Yes, yes, yes. On the list here, we got LA Spike. And this is Noah in here too. Great. All right. So we've got a good, good, good crowd here. Let's continue. Uh, any questions or anything that more detail anyone <clears throat> wants to interject, please just throw it in the chat and I'll, I'll be uh, trying to keep tabs here and, and still be uh, in-depth in this at the same time. <clears throat> Excuse me. As no other age has put human creativity at the center of the universe, the Renaissance spirit also characterizes the development of Ernst Cassirer as the last universal humanist scholar of the 20th century. Born into a prominent Jewish family of Bruslo, Germany, today is Rokla, Poland, in 1874, he entered the University of Berlin in 1892, where he studied law. He soon changed to literature and philosophy, pursuing further studies in history, languages, and the science at the University of Leipzig, Heidelberg, and Munich. In Berlin, he had been introduced to the works of Hermann Cohen by his philosophical teacher, George Simmel, and in 1896, he became one of Cohen's students at the University of Marburg. He soon became the most gifted and ablest student of Cohen, and would subsequently write a dissertation under the auspices of Cohen about the philosophy of Leibniz, 1902. However, unable to find any official commission to a German university because he was Jewish, he became a private dozen and unaccredited teacher in Berlin. Nevertheless, his multi-volume work on the problem of knowledge and the excellent and refined concentration of his theoretical insights in substance and function would earn him a widely acclaimed reputation. Weimar, uh, Weimar marked a definite turning point for Cassirer's career. After First World War, Cassirer left Berlin for the newly founded University of Hamburg, which offered him a position of full professor. He was subsequently elected rector of the University of Hamburg in 1929. Although Kassir started as a philosopher in the Marburg School of Neo-Kantism, he gradually created an original philosophical position. For example, the philosophy of symbolic forms. So this is basically his contribution to philosophy, is the philosophy of symbolic forms, which we will be able to define by the time we finish this introduction. Kassir did not intend his philosophy of symbolic forms to be a new philosophy in itself, 
rather it was for him a new way to approach philosophy with this approach Kassira taught to initiate a transformation of Kant's critique of reason into a critique of culture <clears throat> that is to say a prolo <laughs> prolegomen to a future philosophy of culture commonly regarded as one of the giants in the philosophy of the first half of the 20th century Kassira more or less disappeared from the philosophical discourse after the Second World War. The Davos, remember these guys, Davos, they're still in the news, huh? Debate seems to have contributed influentially to the dismemberment of Kassira's philosophy. Interesting, isn't it? The Davos debate seems to have contributed influentially to the dismemberment of Kassira's philosophy. So, uh, yeah, thanks. So, uh, just an introduction into a book. Thanks. So, that's what a, uh, a pro prolegomenon is a critical or discursive introduction into a book. Philosophy of culture. So, that's what it is to say here his critique of re reason into a critique of culture. So, it was a future. Philosophy of culture. <clears throat> so yes, uh, let's just uh, proceed here. Thanks, Aaron. Noah. appreciate that, and I'm sure our audience does too. Okay, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, uh, Casero was more or less disappeared from the philosophical discourse after the Second World War. Okay, so the Davos the Davos debate seems to have contributed, which the Davos debate they're talking about was in, uh, I, I guess, uh, what year was that, the first one? I thought it was sometime around 29, but it, it's probably after that. Uh, influentially to the dismemberment of Casero's philosophy. So I don't know what went on this Davos debate, but it, it seems to have contributed influentially to dismember his philosophy. However, new and various attempts have been made not only to reassess the Davos debate, but also Casero's philosophy. Let's check this out here before we go on. Uh, anything about the debate? No. Let's see here. but also Kassira's philosophy in general. The so-called Kassira Renaissance in philosophy has as its leading theme that Kassira was not a neo-Kantian philosopher anymore, but maintained an independent position, as was exemplified by Kassira, among others in Davos. Recently, after the interest in the philosophy of Kassira has increased, not only in philosophy, but also in numerous other disciplines. And this is why I'm reading this, is because the philosophy of Kassira has increased not just in philosophy, which we know is, a, is becoming a lost practice, but in numerous other disciplines. In particular, we're kind of uh, in discovering where it applies in law. Furthermore, his inter interdisciplinary prolegomenon prolegomenon to a future philosophy of culture is promising in that his works include elaborated in references to a wide variety of disciplines, which is what's so alluring about Kassira. This is no different for the discipline of jurisprudence. To be concrete, the natural law tradition of human rights is termed by Kassira as the true connection of philosophy within the world. Now, this is a very profound statement. To be concrete, the natural law tradition of human rights is termed by Kassira as the true connection, a true connection of philosophy within the world. We might even say a connection in law is a nexus. But I digress. Let's continue. Accordingly, Kassira, in the first half of the 20th century, established a philosophical 
anthropological justification of human rights through its philosophy of symbolic forms by maintaining that the human being as an animal symbolicum wow is a thoroughly expressive and normative being and that the symbolic nature of man poses certain limits upon every state action moreover man as animal symbolicum achieves its individuality first in an ethical community constituted by laws some pretty deep stuff here uh Kassira himself never wrote a philosophy of law however on many occasions he addressed in public and in writing various topics in the philosophy of law such as constitutionalism social contract theory natural law human rights and law as symbolic form the fact that Kassira has not written a legal philosophy therefore should not directly lead to the conclusion that Kassira did not have a legal philosophy the current study proceeds from existing material Kassira produced in jurisprudence to what these require in the way of supportive context from the perspective of jurisprudence through his archaeological method Kassira's legal philosophy can be extracted from those instances in which he addressed jurisprudential and practical philosophical issues all right let me take a break here for the next paragraph see what we got going in chat here because i see uh there we go ah oh, doesn't fit so let me read it uh, the relationship between scientific and humanistic elements in their subject give rise to a fundamental split or a gulf between philosophies yes and and exactly this uh el Perro, we're going to get into detail exactly what you're talking about because that's exactly what kasir ex ex addresses at the root of what he's doing and uh let's see what else we got here uh the tradition since aristotle has defined a human being as an animal rationale however kasir claimed that the man's outstanding characteristic is not his metaphysical or physical nature but rather in his work humanity cannot be known well we're going to see, yeah, through the analysis of the symbolic universe that man has created, right? We're going to see this as, uh, yeah, the symbol-making man. And we're going to get into this in detail in just a moment. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, natural law and legal philosophy as opposed to natural and scientific philosophies. But we need to have a philosophy that, that actually addresses them both. And as they're saying, Kassira doesn't have a legal philosophy per se however it does function his philosophy in jurisprudence and in the interpretation of law as it applies in the real world so how do you codify nature natural law into a, a structure that humans can use or the animal symbolicum can use uh intergenerationally all right let's continue Good stuff, guys. Therefore, this research attempts to reconstruct and to give a compilation to the philosophy of law of Kassira. Although the inclusion of biographical material serves to clarify and enrich the discussion, this work does not attempt to offer a complete biographical elaboration of the life of Kassira. His widow, Tony Kassira has done this carefully and in detail. So it seems like she wrote a book. Nor does it attempt to give a complete intellectual biography. Okay, so that's not what we're here for anyways. Uh, readers and... Okay, so yeah, do your homework. This isn't a philosophy class, so there won't be any assignments. Uh, so it comes down to this. Uh, furthermore, it's beyond the field of research to explain the Kassira Renaissance in general. However, it is possible to explain here the same trend in practical philosophy and jurisprudence in particular by asking for the motives of this research. 
What is it that makes research into the jurisprudence of Kassira useful and rewarding? That's why we're all here, isn't it? What is it that makes this jurisprudence of Kassira useful and rewarding? And I hope we all leave with that feeling today. Let's continue. Firstly, this work is the most comprehensive attempt to treat the subject of law as a symbolic form. It therefore fills up a lacuna with respect to Kassira's historical contribution to the jurisprudence <clears throat> by reconstructing his philosophy of law and his account of jurisprudence. Second, Kassira himself had a particular interest in law. As his grandson, Peter Kassira, puts it, Ernest Kassira began to study law. His father needed a solicitor for the business, but he very soon changed to Germanistic and also later he had become a philosopher, still devoted himself to philosophy of language and the great German poets. Above all, Goethe, who he took a special room in his heart. His father, Eduard, often complained that his most talented son did not engage himself in the business. So it seems like uh, Kassira didn't want to be an inauthentic corporate male. <laughs> It would have been much better if Ernst had taken care of the factory, he used to say, and that the dull Richard had become a scholar. <laughs> uh, so I think we're on the right track reading uh, Kassira here, when you all agree. Furthermore, the subject of law has been an important element from the very first of Kassira's works, at least as early as his treatment of the philosophy of Leibniz in 1902 is often underestimated in Kassir related literature that his interest in jurisprudence and moral philosophy was significant in relation to his later development. Kassir's engagement with the study of law and moral philosophy, therefore, was relevant both for his personal as well as his philosophical life. Kassir never lost sight of the importance of law. Moreover, his anticipation of the Nazi threat to the German nation demonstrates that a true jurisprudential commitment. When Kassira, in 1933, first heard of the Nazi decree that declared, Law is what suits the Fuhrer. <laughs> Sound familiar? He most fervently declared, If not tomorrow, all legal scholars of Germany will rise up as one and object to these phrases. Germany is lost. Hear that, guys? If not tomorrow, all legal scholars of the, his nation rise up as one and object to these phrases. Our nation is lost. His life in exile is full of examples that refer to and advocate the, print, the fundamental principles of the rule of law and as a fundamental necessity, the bond between truth, and law, or what may be called individual moral judgment. A coherent account of philosophy of law of Kassira will have to give that insight of Kassira the attention that it is due. In addition, our interest in Kassira covers his critical idealism and his early acknowledgement of the potential danger of mass media for the individual moral person and for its sense of responsibility and reflectivity. Interesting, isn't it, back then? Early acknowledgement of the potential danger of mass media for the individual moral person and for its sense of responsibility and reflectivity. He's talking about the mass media sense of responsibility and reflectivity. I think we all feel this, don't we? Kassira was a philosopher who believed in absolute values. For example, in the form of human rights and through his experiences with the problem of scientific knowledge he sought to give his theory of absolute values a theoretical underpinning. Do you understand this? So he's saying that there's problems with scientific knowledge, but he still wants to have absolute values for his theoretical underpinning. 
Kassira's public engagement with the values of the Enlightenment started in the Weimar Republic by emphasizing that the German contribution to the human rights tradition in responding to the theories and practical philosophy that deny the existence of absolute values in the form of individual human rights or subject them to serious doubt. This trend in, is still prevalent today in the form of ethical or moral relativism and cultural relativism, which deny the existence of absolute or universal values respectively by claiming that values differ from person to person and from culture to culture. Although Cassera acknowledges the diversity in culture and ethical life in relation to morality, nevertheless, this does not result for him in moral relativism or nihilism. Among the variety and differences in moral views, Cassera distinguishes certain ethical forms or moral archetypes that are common to all viewpoints. Diverse cultures may think differently, for example, about the treatment of their dead. However, what remains, according to Cassera, is their shared and ethical concern for the dead. So what he's doing from other ethical forms and moral archetypes, distinguishing them, right, is not how they do it, but why they do it. There's an ethical concern. So what Kassira kind of alludes to here is the why is the what in the symbolic form. All right, let's uh, continue here. In this regard, Kassira provides a philosophical perspective for those who wish to believe in absolute values or individual human rights without losing sight of the possible and the future. Important here. Let's read this again because this is sounds a bit confusing, but in an epistemological sense, this is profound. In this regard, Kassira provides a philosophical perspective for those who wish to believe in absolute values, right and wrong, right? Or individual human rights, that we all are endowed with these rights, right? But without, he's, he's providing a philosophical perspective to do this without losing sight of the possible in the future, which is an epistemological trap of the Kantian school, where you're trapped in your innate abilities that were God-given. It doesn't look to the possible or the future. It's only what is known is known. So he doesn't want to uh, lose sight of that. So he's being very careful to not get into that epistemological trap of his predecessors. Let's continue. That the latter aspect, through the maintenance and activation of the critical faculties of man, is crucial for the possibility of the former. An example, human rights became dramatically apparent for Kassira with the rise of the Third Reich. When you start seeing these abuses, now all of a sudden it's dramatically apparent, right? When you see all these beatings on YouTube of, of innocent people and their human rights being violated so blatantly and the rise of that, you know, that's that becomes dramatically apparent for us. Yeah, yeah, he's not worth having that quote. I won't even dignify him with that. You get that from, uh, I could give you where he got that from. Kassira, though, anticipated the possibility of such a threat through his philosophy of symbolic forms, specifically by his references to mythical thought. Critical thought, Kassira held, did not defeat myth itself, but only its products and configurations from the earliest times. Pre-Socratic thought, philosophy opposed logos to mythos and was victorious over it again and again. But myth never seems to recede. Philosophy has an important normative task, according to Kassira, because only through the maintenance of the equilibrium between various symbolic forms, by assuring the distinctiveness of each in this plurality, right? We have an equilibrium in the maintenance of various symbolic forms, right? And assuring their distinctiveness in the plurality. No blurring of distinctions of symbolic forms, and hence by retaining their distinctive formative powers. Can we prevent mythical thought from dominating 
and emasculating our critical faculties. What another great statement. Because only through the maintenance of the equilibrium between the various symbolic forms, the equilibrium between various symbolic forms, by assuring the distinctiveness of each in this plurality, right? So the plurality of the various symbolic forms. We have many symbolic forms. They each need to be distinct and assure a distinctiveness of them. Clear definitions of each symbolic form and hence retaining their distinctive formative powers. So by blurring them, they actually lose their power. So we could prevent mythical thought from dominating and emasculating our critical faculties, the formative powers. Myth emasculates our formative powers. The cultivation of our critical faculties or culture was a solution for Kassira to the pertinent crisis in pre-war Germany, pre-war Germany. The striking feature of the myths of the 20th century, though, is their technique or method of implementation. Uh -huh. Myth has always been described as the result of an unconscious activity. Uh, hang on, let me, let me catch up with the, the chat here before we get to this quote. So we have, uh, let's see, yeah, we'll skip the Donald Rumsfeld quote, as I said there, because he, he plagiarized that one. Yes, yes, indeed, disciple. And I could get into this actually from the most ancient text I've found this in. It uh, goes back to the Jainism. And the unknown unknown. Well, there's, uh, I could get into that if you'd like. Do you want to you hear that one? We can uh, take a little break. I think I have the book handy here, too. Uh, darn it. Where is it? Well, no, I don't. I don't have it handy. Thought I did. Well, I have it around. Next time I'll bring it out. But we'll, we'll get into that, that. It's not too long, but it's enlightening for a lot of people. That you'd enjoy to hear this, uh, where this comes from, and it's from the the Jane, so it's it's ancient. All right, let's continue here. Just want to digress for a second because I know this gets a little bit, uh, it can get a little tiresome sometimes, and I understand because reading does, for some, and I know it's been less done these days with other forms of of entertainment, so. I'd like to try to make this as exciting as possible and interactive, and that's why I enjoy you guys being here for a live stream, because this makes it fun for everyone. All right, let's continue with this quote here. Myth has always been described as the result of an unconscious activity and as a free product of imagination. But here we find myth made according to plan. Interesting. Myth has always been described as a result of an unconscious activity and as a free product of imagination. We're talking about the 20th century now, the striking feature, but here we find myth made according to plan. Ah, the new political myths do not grow up freely. They are artificial things, fabricated by very skillful and cunning artisans. Henceforth, myths can be manufactured in the same sense and according to the same methods as any other modern weapon, as machine guns or airplanes. That is a new thing, and a thing of crucial importance. It has changed the form of our social life, writes Kassira. Profound. Myth is not a given thing, according to Kassira, but a process or state of mind. What state are you in? I'm in a state of myth. In mythical thought, one dissolves in the many. Ah. And as such, the individual cannot 
nay, may not carry individual responsibility or make moral judgments reflectively. Man dominated by myth mythical thought loses his sense of individuality or sense of moral personality. Consequently, such a person cannot enter into a social contract or be the subject of rights and obligations. Albert Speer, one of Hitler's henchmen, who read Kassir's Myth of the State after the Nuremberg trials and was struck by its relevance, stated most tellingly, Now, I was completely under Hitler's spell. Unreversedly and unthinkingly, I held by him. I was ready to follow him anywhere. Yet his ostensible interest in me was only to launch me on a glorious career as an architect. Years later, in Spandau, I read Ernest Cassier's comment on the men who of their own accord threw away man's highest privilege to be an autonomous person. Now, I was one of them. According to Cassier, mass media facilitated the emergence of mythical thought in the form of 20th century totalitarian politics and the totalitarian state. For Kassira, this entailed more than the mere massive spread of propaganda or ideology. In his political pathology, or what may be called here his pathology of passive obedience, Sira explains how mass media initiated and sustained a change in the function of language. The function of language. Mass media initiated and sustained a change in the function of language, and hence in the mentality of the people, by stressing and appealing to its common root with myth. A coherent account on the, of the philosophy of law of Kassira will also have to make clear the relation between law, language, and myth. In this respect, Kassira provides a context for his view of law through his philosophy of symbolic forms, where he explains that we grasp law first in that mythical concatenation. To combine, it's a mythical combination, a chain, say, of a, of a process. And that mythical concatenation is, a, I guess, is trying to refer to the process that he was saying earlier. As indicated, although Kassira designated law as symbolic form, he never gave an elaborate exploration of law as a symbolic form in the same way he did with the symbolic forms of language, myth, and science. It is therefore the specific aim of our research to make a connection between the philosophy of symbolic forms and the discipline of law. It is therefore not our aim to answer the question whether law is a symbolic form, as we rely on the fact that Kassira already considered law as a symbolic form and shortly elaborated it on it systematically but rather to investigate how and why law is a symbolic form. So that's what we're talking about. How and why law is a symbolic form. The questions of how law is a symbolic form and why law is a symbolic form ultimately depend on the question of how law manifests itself in reality. Do you see this? how it's a symbolic form and why is going to be how it manifests itself in reality in the lives and minds of people. Law is a phenomenon that shapes human lives by giving people a particular means to cope with life, to create objectivity and determinacy in human life and conduct, and forms the expression and configuration of the symbolic nature of the human species.
Accordingly, law as symbolic form is to adopt a certain perspective on law, whereby we investigate the semiotic. What's a semiotic? It's like the storytelling, right? Meaning behind myths. Semiotic and symbolic structures that support law. In this respect, law as symbolic form gives a functional answer or perspective to the question of the nature of law. Symbolic form gives a functional answer. Do you see functional means it's going to have some action in the real world? Or perspective, meaning rational perspective because it reflects the real world to the question of the nature of law. All right, are we all still here? It seems like the chat's not moving, but this is pretty deep. It maintains that law can only be known through its manifestation in our lives and minds. Law can only be known through its manifestation in our lives and minds. For example, that law is a castle in the air which we experience at the most extreme when our trust in the law or a legal system results in great disappointment, such as in Nazi Germany or apar apartheid South Africa. Nonetheless, law unmistakably plays a useful function in the life of man. It is a specifically human product. A life without law would be like living without language. Without law, we would have to live without that extra dimension by which we can plan or order our common lives. Without law as symbolic form, our existence becomes less humane or as Grotius founder of the modern natural law theory and of international law, put it, law is a necessary condition for the hum humani humanitis ipsa. Oh, jeez. Translation, anyone. <laughs> law is a typically human product because our symbolic capacities stand at its foundation a typically human product because our symbolic capacities are what are the foundation of law our symbolic capacities well this is one we're going to have to look up humanitas ispa ipsa ipsa yeah well maybe it's misspelled but 22 let's see what it says here we got to uh jeez German, maybe. I don't know. No, it's Latin, isn't it? All right. We'll come back to that one. Moreover, by taking into consideration the symbolic nature of man, Kassira gives a philosophical and anthropological foundation to human rights, supported by the latest scientific developments in the study of man, in that, incidentally, escapes the latest critiques voiced in relation to the universality of, man, of human rights. An example, from an external as well as from an internal perspective. So human rights, you know, this is something that's being overlooked and escapes the latest critiques, the latest scientific developments. And this is, you know, going back to the before the middle of the 20th century. So quite disappointing in that respect that it's still being overlooked and being escaped by critiques. Through his concept of the animal symbolicum, Kassira gives a renewed foundation to human dignity and hence to human rights. A renewed foundation. Remember, the foundation of law is built on the capacity of our symbolic not constructs, right? Uh, what was the our symbolic capacity stand at the foundation of law? As opposed to other animals, man lives not only in a single space or habitat. The vitality Lebensraus, as Kassira calls it. We'll let him say it then. I need to practice my Latin, guys. It seems like I'm going to be having to pronounce it more. 
but he also lives in a symbolic life world. The ratio is not the distinguishing factor of man, because animals too display a certain kind of intelligence or rationality. Reason does not exhaust the capabilities of man to intelligently cope with his environment. Kassira suggests that man is foremost in a symbolic being, an animal symbolicum. All right, guys, are you ready? Get out your number, number seven Esquire pencil and get ready to take notes here. We're getting to the essence of it here, and I, I'm really, uh, there's only a few of us left here. Well, I appreciate everyone that's still with us. We're getting to the best part now. Let me read this here, guys. Man has, as it were, discovered a new method of adapting himself to his environment. Between the receptor system and the effector system, which are to be found in all animal species, we find in man a third link, which we may describe as the symbolic system. This new acquisition transforms the whole of human life. As compared with the other animals, man lives not merely in a broader reality, he lives, so to speak, in a new dimension of reality. No longer can man confront reality immediately. He cannot see it, as it were, face to face. Physical reality seems to recede in proportion as man's symbolic activity advances. Instead of dealing with the things themselves, man is, in a sense, constantly conversing with himself. He has so enveloped himself in linguistic forms, in artistic images, in mythical symbols or religious rites, that he cannot see or know anything except by this artificial medium. To illustrate, likewise, the Cambridge psychologist Crick has, found, has put forward the idea that the function of the organism's nervous system is to set up a symbolic model of the external world. The brain imitates or models external processes. The function of such symbolization is plain. If the organism carries a small-scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions within its head, it is able to try out various alternatives, conclude which is the best of them, react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events in dealing with the present or future, and every way to react in such fuller, safer, and more competent manner to the emergencies which face it. Impulses from the environment are no longer directly responded by stimuli, but man finds it necessary to pause and give a symbolic reaction to give meaning to the outer world. As the 20th century original thinker Arthur Kostler explains, all right, another great quote coming here. For man, is a symbol, for man is a symbol-making animal. He constructs a symbolic model of outer reality in his brain and expresses it by a second set of symbols in terms of words, equations, pigment, or stone. All he knows directly are bodily sensations. All he can directly do is perform bodily motions. The rest of his knowledge and means of expression is symbolical. Any attempt to get a direct grasp at naked reality is self-defeating. Urania, too, like the other muses, always has a last veil left to fold in. To continue, similarly, in a recent study in neurobiology, this isn't recent, so 
Terence Deacon in The Symbolic Species has shown that man is a strange phenomenon in nature. Human evolutionary history shows an anomaly as a result of which humans started to make use of a symbolic meaning giving. According to Deacon, oh shit. care of that. Damn. All right. Um, according to Deacon, the transition to a meat substance strategy, which was accompanied by tool use, posed certain socio-ecological problems for mankind. Uh-oh. Meat substance strategy? That's the northern climates. While female members of the group cannot go hunting because they have to nurse siblings, upon return, male members need to have an incentive to share the meat they hunt. A particular male member of the group will agree to share the meat with a particular female member only when she is secured that the continuity of his genes are taken care of and not that of another. The transition initiated the wish or the necessity to attain a social structure that guaranteed unambiguous and exclusive mating and that was sufficiently egalitarian to sustain cooperation via shared or parallel reproductive interests. This, re this social reproductive dilemma, according to Deacon, served as the initial impetus for the symbol evolution because it required the ability to share common, inten common intentions Here's that word, intentions, which comes back to law. Interest, goals, and emotions. Interesting, huh? So it served as the initial impetus. That whole thing of uh, uh, cooperation, shared parallel, or shared or parallel productive interest became the impetus for symbolic revolution because it required the ability to share common intentions, interests, goals, and emotions as the most effective means for coordinating behavior and being able to imagine and anticipate another's mental and emotional responses. I think we call that a, what's a theory of, uh, oh gosh, Theory of others, I forget what it's called. Theory of mind. We call that theory of mind, I think, nowadays. You know, to imagine and anticipate another's mental and emotional responses. They call that now, I think, a theory of mind. As a powerful tool for solutions for social manipulation. So when it was originally done to be able to share common intention, intentions, interests, goals, and emotions. Right, and it was done for cooperation via shared or parallel reproductive interests, but now it's become a powerful tool for social manipulation, the symbolic system. So now we're looking at the evolution of it according to Deacon. So that's one perspective. According to Deacon, man found a solution for the social reproductive dilemma in the construction of a symbolic agreement. That involves a promise by those who are party to the social agreement and have something to lose if one individual takes advantage of an uncondoned sexual opportunity. Although Deacon may be right in tracing the origin of the symbolic faculties of man to the social reproductive dilemma, he does make clear why it was imperative for man to represent a social contract and why social contracts are necessarily symbolic in nature. One of the primary functions of symbolization is to build an independent mental representation of the subjective experience of another, so represented as if one were able to trade places with the other. By sharing other people's minds, other people's minds and representations, of their experiences, man solved the problem of organizing group behavior around something as intangible as a desired future habit 
of behavior. Interesting. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, these are some questions we're going to have to open up in just a moment here. Because... Uh, Yeah, and that's something uh, that's important here because what we are talking about the, uh, the the animal the meat sustenance as opposed to you know uh, when it's done for a uh, you know the profit thing or for the power industrial institution or uh, industrialized. All right, through the manipulation of symbols, man discovered the ability to create models of others emotional states and to exercise restraint or determination with respect to them. So you can assign an emotional state to exercise restraint. There's other emotional states that will exercise determination. And man discovered the ability to create m models of others and then manipulate those symbols. Do you see this? So this is where it goes wrong. Symbolization enables man to exercise empathy or imaginative interchange, as Eben Kahn put it. With symbolization, nature has equipped man with an instrument of self-defense, because when each projects himself into the shoes of another, of other, of the other, wrong or injustice to the other person will be regarded as personal aggression, which subsequently triggers those affections of the vice versa of the of the viscera and abnormal secretions of the adrenals that prepare the human mind to resist attack. Oh wow. Yeah, so let's see here. Uh... Yeah, bird watching uh, El Perro, I know what you're talking about there. Uh, let me read that out because it didn't fit the screen. The sense of use, seek. I can hunt all the animals I want. Never heard of bird watching. They hunt, and once they see what they seek, they watch no longer seeking. So, in essence, that's what we're talking about right here, is that a symbolic system of seeking is enough to satisfy. You know, it's almost a satisfaction of the libido, if, if uh, you want to put it into that context. And it's... It, it, actually triggers the abnormal secretions of your glands, the adrenals. That's where adrenaline comes from, right? And prepare the human mind to resist attack. So the mere ideas can cause secretions of your, of your glands. But it has to be constructed where you project yourself into someone else. And then the wrong or injustice would be regarded as a personal aggression. You see, this is a uh, part of empathy. This symbolic system of empathy. See, once you've made a symbolic system that can trigger a hormonal reaction, now you have a consequence in the real world. Consequently, as Eric Gans has said in various different terms in anthropology, because no man wants to invoke the aggression of another and so disturb the social arrangement that guarantees for him a certain beneficial or egalitarian, egalitarian distribution of goods, he displays manners. Or restraint. Therefore, the prey is not directly torn apart and immediately digested, but man first grasp it in terms of an object. Back to what uh, El Perro was saying there. Only man is in the position to come to terms literally with his fellow being. <whistles> Only man is in the position to come to terms literally with his fellow being. To come to terms. Come to terms. Remember, we're talking about symbolic form of law when we come to terms literally with his fellow being. In social life, mainly through linguistic forms, man discovers his true an example symbolic nature, because as such, the symbolic excludes the mere subjective and includes the other. As Kassira notes, 
Only man is in the position to understand another through the various symbolic forms that he has devised for himself. Oh, so, wow. So, consequently, his capacity for what we call, in this book, symbolic interchange and perspectival flexibility enables him to establish and maintain a specifically human social life. So the capacity for is symbolic interchange, meaning, again, you can understand another through the various symbolic forms that you devise for yourself. And they also are using those symbolic forms. So you know how the symbolic form works with you, and you know pretty certain that that same symbolic form is going to work with that other person. They may be colorblind, they may speak another language, but the symbolic form, right? That symbolic interchange is in, in perspective, perspectival flexibility, flexibility and perspective, meaning you could change your perspective to think of someone else, that theory of mind, enables him to establish and maintain a specifically human social life, unlike an insect social life. However, while the fact that man uses symbols distinguishes him from an animal, it also makes him vulnerable to different dangers. Through the acquisition or the availability of symbolic capacities, man can inflict upon his fellow man that which he cannot upon members of other species, as the latter are excluded from the specifically human realm of the symbolic. Not only can one man deprive the life or property of another, moreover, he can be mean, denigrating, even genocidal, just because the other is a human, and therefore a symbol-using being, i.e. because the sheer presence of the other impugns on the symbolic life world. Myth, as a mental process or state of mind in this respect, can easily become instrumental because of its specific perception of expression. Myth accords to every outward sign a physiognomic quality or meaning. Physiognomic. Never heard this word before. Yes, this, uh, I hope you all are sticking around for this. I know it's getting uh, pretty long. What are we at here? We're over the hour mark, but um, you see, we're hanging in there. We're actually pretty close to the end of this uh, introduction. Let's just finish this up. And then we have, uh, if we have time, we're going to have a, a special guest on here to do some uh, recap and a quick commentary on this so we can try to find ways of bringing this into our, our regular life and bring more meaning into these symbolic structures that are quite literally all around us. Okay. So myth accords to every outward sign a physiognomic quality or meaning. Because myth does not operate dialogically, but rather by the invocation of the authority of seniority, is inimical to individual moral progress. Through its physiognomic perception of expression, it can easily lead to a demonization or dehumanization of the other. You see this. Myth, as a state of mind, thinks in terms of collectives instead of individual human persons, the we instead of the I, and in terms of good and evil instead of the shades of gray, as I would say, of human dignity. The problem with duality is that you can overlook these things. And if your symbolic system doesn't provide for human dignity, you could be stuck with hard definitions that may not be fully accurate in the real world. Human dignity for Kasira cannot be given a foundation in some substantial or metaphysical concept, not even in rationality, nor can it rest on distinctly religious grounds. For Kasira, human dignity can only be given a functional foundation, and rest in the symbolic nature of man. So let's see, how can we get a functional, meaning, you know, it functions in the real world. 
Yeah, Dogma, the chat's been interactive, so pipe in at, at, at uh, Liberty. <laughs> so, what makes the human being special and raises him above the rest of nature is his capacity to relate to other human beings symbolically and only in its relating to the other as a meaningful being through the various symbolic forms, hence the appreciation of the humanity of the other. Can the human being appreciate its own individual humanity? Well, what a concept, huh? So what makes us special, right, is our capacity to relate to other human beings symbolically. And only in this relating to others as a meaningful being through the various symbolic forms, hence the appreciation of the humanity of the other, can the human being appreciate its own individual humanity. Do you see this problem? This is why there's so much self-hatred, I believe, is because when the, the symbolic systems, right, the various symbolic forms don't have an appreciation of humanity in general, there could be no humanity of the individual. By progressively relating to other human beings, the individual not only attests to its individual humanity, but also creates its view of the world. Accordingly, the various symbolic forms respectively contribute to the personal outlook of the individual. That is to say, constitute its personality or identity. So the various symbolic forms respectively contribute to the personal outlook of the individual. So the personal outlook of the individual constitutes their personality or identity. The many conflicts and tensions between the various symbolic forms are resolved only in the concrete acting individual. The many conflicts and tensions between the various symbolic forms are only resolved in the concrete acting individual. You see this. So when there's conflicts or tensions in symbolic forms, it drags it into the real world. And then we have to deal with it there, as is wars and fights and battles because of conflicts and tensions in various symbolic systems. Wouldn't that be a good assessment? Furthermore, man has so enveloped himself in symbols and symbolic meanings that they have not only become part and parcel of the very structure of his intellect and feeling, or personality, but that he henceforward also cannot promptly escape from them. As a result of this, Susan K. Langer has explained, failure or destruction of life symbols important to any person is always felt as the most intolerable injury one man or group of men can do to another. The destruction of life symbols. Failure of life symbols. Always felt as the most intolerable injury one man or group of men can do to another. Freedom of conscience is the basis of all personal freedom. To constrain a man against his principles is to endanger his attitude towards the world. His personal strength and single-mindedness, the very expression of an alien mythology, incompatible with one's own vision of fact or truth, works to the corruption of that vision. It is always felt as an insult exceeding even ridicule and abuse. Common insult is a blow at one's ego, but a constraint of conscience strikes at one's ego and superego one's whole world, humanity, and purpose. Law, too, gives rise to symbolic perceptions and expectations. His or her rights make the citizen of a rule of law differ from that of a rule of men. His or her rights make the citizen 
of a rule of law differ from that of a rule of men. A world without law or rights would be an entirely different one, and the loss or denial of rights, like that of many other communal source of meaning, while disorienting, can in itself be a cause of suffering or of felt injustice. Law's meaning has become part of our perception of the world, for example, our personal outlook in identity. This pathology of the rule of law makes us see that law, too, has become a symbolic form, yet at another stage and level. All right, we got Jeremy in the house. This is really the good stuff here, so uh, we'll get into the meat of it, so to speak. <laughs> For Kassira, law like all other symbolic forms, is a particular way for human beings to create a cosmos out of chaos, to relate to others, and in doing so, to create a world of their own. Moreover, law in the form of human rights is a necessary element of human rights, of human life. I want everyone to catch this part here. This is a good one for the notes. Law, in the form of human rights, is a necessary element of human life. It is a conditio sine qua non for a characteristically human life. The fundamental human right to the free development of personalities stands at the basis of the capability of the human being as an animal symbolicum to contribute to the progressive development of culture. So, get this here. The fundamental human right to the free development of personality. What's personality? He defined it here as the, uh, what were we saying here? It was the conscience, it was the uh, personality here, right? Well, I lost it here. Too many of these uh, black squiggly lines on the screen. But I think we caught that part there, right? The uh, a part of the personality at the basis of the capability of human being as the animal symbolicum to contribute to the progressive development of, pro of culture, the progressive. So we want to progress our culture. Indeed, without due regard to fundamental human rights, man is in, is in the position, is not in the position, to contribute in his reflective and symbolic capacities to create culture. Yes, um, this is incredible here. Without due regard to fundamental human rights, man is not in the position to contribute in his reflective and symbolic capacities to create culture. So without fundamental human rights, you don't really have the capacity, the symbolic capacity, to create culture in the first place, which is defined by Kassira as a process of man's progressive self-liberation. That's a nice definition of culture, if it so was. All right, so... Let's see what we got going here. Individual liberty, as we explain in this book, becomes a cultural imperative. So, pretty deep stuff here. Fundamental human rights is necessary to create culture, which is a process of man's progressive self-liberation. The process of man's progressive self-liberation. Individual liberty, as we explain in this book, becomes a cultural imperative. So we're talking about the symbolic form of law, or law as a symbolic form. Yet, here we end this with individual liberty, as we explain in this book, becomes a cultural imperative, must be done.
without respect for human rights. Not only is man in danger of losing his culturally constructive meaning bestowing capacities, but also societies in danger of receding into chaos and barbarism. Without the guaranteeing of human rights, law loses its character as a symbolic form, i.e. its function and capacity to create order out of chaos. That's its function to give meaning and shape to human life and actions. A systematic denial of the fundamental human rights will result in the rule of law no longer governing human life because it loses its persuasive power. Moreover, when law fails to give meaning and shape human life, it will give room for other, perhaps more primitive elements to take over. I think uh, Eric had a presentation where it showed what happens when we regress like this. It can give way, according to Kassira, to the power of myth. Through his philosophy of symbolic forms, in particular when he refers to myth, Kassira sought to, con sought to countenance the fatalistic trends of his time, which put great, if not lethal, stress on the new democracy of Weimar and the Western culture in general. In various ways, Kassira tried to uphold his belief in values such as democracy and the rule of law, which necessitated him to give battle with forces that were destructive to the polity in, of Weimar and the, the ideals for which it stood. Humanity, an example. Here we go. Our narrative, therefore, starts with the Weimar era, inserts an intermezzo with the Davos debate in 1929. So it was 1929, the Davos debate. So we're still going there for a, a while. And pursues Kassira as a public person, also when he was in exile. We have established that Kassira was not a mere theoretical philosopher, and that significantly, throughout his works, he provides himself with the context through which to understand his philosophy of law, in particular, the a priori nature, a priori nature of law, and its connection to individual moral reason. We thereupon focus on his main systematical work. An example, the philosophy of symbolic forms and its relation to the field of law. Kassira's jurisprudence and view of the social contract take as their starting point a new concept of man, the concept of the animal, animal symbolicum, leads to the view that law is a symbolic form and that the social contract is symbolic in nature. Furthermore, we focus on the main source of inspiration for Kassira, his indebtedness to the jurisprudence of the Marburg School and that of Hermann Cohen in particular is obvious. Therefore, while investigating the commonalities with neo-Kantian philosophy and jurisprudence, due regard is given to the distinguishing elements of Kassira's philosophy and legal theory. In this book, we describe the rule of law as, here we go guys, pay attention, the rule of law is the reign of persuasion rather than the reign of force. In democracy as reign by persuasion rather than the reign by force. On that note, um, I want to see if there's anyone that's still in the room here that we can get some feedback perhaps on what we were talking about because the next part's just the structure of the book, which we're not going to go through the book because it's a pretty long book. But I think from this introduction, uh, Yeah, Silly Wabbit, great, great that you came in. Yeah, this is, uh, you might want to hear it again in its entirety because it is quite a sophisticated topic, you know, when you consider it's so far-reaching and not just the concept of the symbolic system and the uh, animal symbolicum, but the the whole concept of how 
a functional philosophy can apply to law. And then when you take that approach of, of that perspective of the symbolic form of law, that when you take out something as critical to its functioning, foundational to its fa functioning as human rights, that it all falls apart. That you no longer have a reign of persuasion. You can no longer have a, 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 a reign by persuasion either. You have to do it all by force. So the big change in humanity was the symbolic system of the uh, law as a symbolic form with the element of human rights as its foundation. So when you take the foundation away, that whole symbolic form falls apart. So again, rule of law as the reign of persuasion rather than the reign of force. Because remember, the symbolic system we have to agree on. So there's an element of consent and persuasion in law, the rule of law. But if that symbolic system takes into account human rights, then it's a very persuasive argument. Without it, you're down to force. And of course, democracy as the reign by persuasion rather than the reign by force. So some pretty deep concepts here. Um, and I'd like to just to see if there's anyone else that wanted to uh, chime in on this. If not, I was wondering if Eric is still in the chat there and see if he could uh, chime in on some of this too, because I know he has some first-hand knowledge of some of these concepts too, and especially regarding the myth. And that's something I want to bring Eric about to comment on, because he made a whole presentation about how uh, just near the end, you know, there's the one part that when law fails to give meaning and shape to human life, it will give room for another, perhaps more primitive elements, right? And that element right there is one of the dangers. Yep, yeah, okay. Um, oh, check it out. Look who's here. All right, just give me a moment, guys. We're going to be bringing on a special guest. I'm just going to leave some music on for uh, interlude, and then we're going to have a special guest on in just a moment. Uh, give me about uh, two minutes, and we'll have them right up. In the meantime, enjoy some music here. <laughs> 